The Eastern Gate of Jerusalem is a very special and unique gate in the Old City of Jerusalem. It is the only gate that faces the Mount of Olives, and it is the oldest and most sacred gate of the city. It is also known as the Golden Gate, or the Gate of Mercy, because of its beauty and significance. The gate has been sealed since 1541, and no one is allowed to enter or exit through it. But why is this gate so important, and what does it have to do with our faith? Join me on a voyage through prophecy, history, and faith as we peel back the layers of mystery surrounding the gate that was sealed by a monarch and anticipates its ultimate destiny in the annals of eternity. To grasp the significance of the sealed gateway, we must first traverse the corridors of history. This gateway is none other than the Eastern Gate of Jerusalem, also renowned as the Golden Gate. Historically, this gate holds profound importance both strategically and spiritually within the ancient walls of Jerusalem. But what prompted its sealing, and who was the architect behind this momentous decision? Our journey leads us to the 16th century, during the reign of Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent of the Ottoman Empire. In a strategic maneuver that continues to intrigue historians and theologians, he issued the decree to seal the gateway. Yet, this decision transcended mere defense or architectural strategy. It was deeply entwined with the religious convictions and prophecies of the era. The sealing of the gateway represented more than just the closure of a physical passage. It resonated across the annals of time, echoing the sacred beliefs and prophecies cherished by adherents of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam alike. For Christians, this act assumed a prophetic significance, perceived as the fulfillment of biblical prophecy and a harbinger of future events foretold in Christian eschatology. As we delve deeper into this historical episode, the multifaceted significance of the sealed gateway begins to emerge. It is not merely a relic of bygone eras, it serves as a symbolic nexus that unites history, prophecy, and faith. In the ensuing segment, we shall delve into the prophecy and its realization, shedding light on how this historical event is interpreted through the prism of Christian belief. Having plumbed the depths of the historical ceiling of the Eastern Gate, we now pivot to explore its prophetic dimensions. The first time we read about the Eastern Gate in the Bible is in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel was a prophet who lived during the time of the Babylonian exile, when the people of Judah were taken captive by the Babylonians and the Temple of God was destroyed. Ezekiel had many visions from God, and one of them was about the restoration of the Temple and the city of Jerusalem. In Ezekiel chapter 43, verses 1 to 5, we read, Then the man brought me to the gate facing east, and I saw the glory of the God of Israel coming from the east. His voice was like the roar of rushing waters, and the land was radiant with his glory. The vision I saw was like the vision I had seen when he came to destroy the city, and like the visions I had seen by the Kibar River. And I fell face down. The glory of the Lord entered the temple through the gate facing east. Then the Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. This is an amazing vision of God's glory returning to the temple after it had departed because of the people's sin and idolatry. The glory of God is the visible manifestation of God's presence, power, and holiness. It is often described as a bright light, a fire, a cloud, or a voice. The glory of God is what makes God different from anyone or anything else. It is what makes God worthy of our worship and praise. The Eastern Gate was the gate through which the glory of God entered the temple, and it was also the gate through which the glory of God left the temple. In Ezekiel chapter 10 verses 18 and 19 we read, Then the glory of the Lord departed from over the threshold of the temple and stopped above the cherubim. While I watched, the cherubim spread their wings and rose from the ground, and as they went, the wheels went with them. They stopped at the entrance of the east gate of the Lord's house, and the glory of the God of Israel was above them. This was a sad and tragic moment, when God's glory left the temple because of the people's rebellion and disobedience. The temple was supposed to be the place where God dwelled among his people, and where his people could meet with him and worship him. But the people had turned away from God, and had filled the temple with idols and abominations. God could not tolerate such wickedness, and he had to judge his people and allow their enemies to destroy the temple and the city. But God did not abandon his people forever. He promised to restore them and to rebuild the temple. He promised to bring back his glory and to dwell among them again. 
He promised to show them His mercy and grace and to forgive them and heal them. He promised to make a new covenant with them and to give them a new heart and a new spirit. He promised to send them a Savior, a Messiah, who would fulfill all His promises and plans. And that brings us to the next event that involves the Eastern Gate, the Triumphal Entry of Jesus. The Triumphal Entry The second time we read about the Eastern Gate in the Bible is in the New Testament, in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They all tell us the story of how Jesus entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, riding on a donkey, and fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah. In Matthew chapter 21 verses 1 to 11 we read, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, with her colt by her. Untie them, and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. This is an amazing scene of Jesus entering Jerusalem as the King of Israel, the Son of David, the Messiah. He entered through the Eastern Gate, the same gate that the glory of God had entered and left. He entered on a donkey, a humble and peaceful animal, not on a horse, a proud and warlike animal. He entered in fulfillment of the prophecy of Zechariah, who wrote in chapter 9 verse 9, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He entered with the praise and acclamation of the people, who welcomed him with palm branches and shouts of Hosanna, which means, save us, or save us now. He entered in the name of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He entered as the savior of the world, the one who came to die for our sins and to rise again for our justification. The Eastern Gate was the gate through which Jesus entered Jerusalem, and it was also the gate through which Jesus left Jerusalem. In Luke chapter 24 verses 50 and 51 we read, When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. This was a glorious and joyful moment when Jesus ascended to heaven after his resurrection and after he had appeared to his disciples and taught them for 40 days. He ascended from the Mount of Olives, which is opposite the Eastern Gate, and he ascended to the right hand of God, where he intercedes for us and prepares a place for us. He ascended as the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, the one who has all authority in heaven and on earth, and the one who will come back in power and glory. But before he ascended, he gave his disciples a mission and a promise. He told them to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey everything he had commanded them. And he promised to be with them always, to the very end of the age. The Healing of the Lame Man The third time we read about the Eastern Gate in the Bible is in the book of Acts in chapter 3. This is the story of how Peter and John healed a lame man in the name of Jesus and preached the gospel to the crowd. In Acts chapter 3 verses 1 to 10 we read, one day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, Look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong, 
he jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. This is an amazing miracle of healing and salvation that happened at the eastern gate of the temple, also known as the Beautiful Gate. This gate was probably the most ornate and splendid gate of the temple made of bronze and decorated with gold and silver. It was the gate that led to the court of the women, where anyone could enter and pray. It was also the gate where many beggars and cripples gathered, hoping to receive some alms from the worshippers. One of these beggars was a man who had been lame from birth. He had never walked in his life, and he had to depend on others to carry him and to provide for him. He had no hope and no dignity, and he had no access to the temple and to God. He was a picture of our spiritual condition before we met Jesus. We were lame and helpless, unable to walk in God's ways and to enter His presence. We were poor and needy, unable to pay for our sins and to receive His blessings. We were hopeless and desperate, looking for something or someone to fill our emptiness and to give us meaning. But then Peter and John came along, and they changed his life forever. They did not give him what he asked for, but they gave him what he needed. They did not give him money but they gave him Jesus. They did not give him a temporary relief, but they gave him a permanent transformation. They did not give him a handout, but they gave him a hand up. They did not give him a crutch, but they gave him a cure. They did not give him a pity, but they gave him a power. They did not give him a religion, but they gave him a relationship. They healed him in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the same Jesus who had entered and left the Eastern Gate, the same Jesus who had died and risen again the same Jesus who had ascended to heaven and sent his spirit. They healed him by the authority and the power of Jesus, the only name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. They healed him by the grace and the mercy of Jesus, the one who loves us and gave himself for us. They healed him by the faith and the obedience of Jesus, the one who calls us and commands us to follow him. And the result was amazing. The man who had never walked, walked. The man who had never jumped, jumped. The man who had never praised God, praised God. The man who had been a beggar, became a witness. The man who had been a burden, became a blessing. The man who had been a problem, became a proof. The man who had been a spectacle, became a spectacle. He went with Peter and John into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. He attracted the attention of the people, who recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the Eastern Gate. They were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. They wanted to know how and why this miracle had occurred. And that gave Peter and John the opportunity to preach the gospel to them. The preaching of the gospel. The fourth and final time we read about the Eastern Gate in the Bible is in the same chapter of Acts, in verses 11 to 26. This is the sermon that Peter preached to the crowd that gathered around the healed man. In Acts chapter 3 verses 11 to 26 we read, While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah, who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything, as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. 
anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. Indeed, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets who have spoken have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, Through your offspring all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. This is an amazing sermon of conviction and invitation that Peter preached at the eastern gate of the temple, the same gate where the glory of God had entered and left, the same gate where Jesus had entered and left, the same gate where the lame man had been healed and saved. Peter preached with boldness and clarity, with wisdom and power, with compassion and urgency. He preached to the people of Israel, the chosen people of God, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the heirs of the prophets and of the covenant, he preached about Jesus, the servant of God, the son of God, the Messiah of God. He preached about his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and his return. He preached about his name, his authority, his power, his grace, and his salvation. He preached about the miracle, the prophecy, the fulfillment, the repentance, and the blessing. He preached the gospel the good news, the best news, the only news that can save us and change us. He preached the gospel that we all need to hear and to believe. He preached the gospel that we all need to share and to spread. He preached the gospel that we all need to live and to love. And the result was amazing. The people who heard Peter's sermon were cut to the heart. And they asked him and the other apostles, what shall we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And about three thousand of them accepted his message and were baptized. They joined the fellowship of the believers, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. They praised God and enjoyed the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved, the application to our lives. So my friends, what can we learn from the Eastern Gate of Jerusalem? And what does it mean for us as Christians? How can we apply its message to our lives? Well, the Eastern Gate reminds us of God's mercy, grace, and salvation for those who believe in Jesus Christ. The Gate is called the Gate of Mercy because it shows us that God is merciful and compassionate and that he wants to forgive us and save us from our sins. The gate is also called the golden gate because it shows us that God is glorious and majestic and that he deserves our. The gate is also called the eastern gate because it shows us that God is faithful and trustworthy and that he will fulfill his promises and his plans. This gateway stands as a potent emblem of Jesus' unparalleled significance in Christian salvation history, serving as a poignant reminder of the imminent realization of divine pledges. Contemplating this intricate tapestry of events and beliefs, we're struck by the profound depth and intricacy of religious symbolism, capable of imparting profound spiritual insights. The sealed gate of Jerusalem transcends mere architectural form, it radiates as a beacon of hope, anticipation, and unwavering faith for countless souls across the globe. The Eastern Gate also challenges us to prepare ourselves for the return of Jesus Christ. Just as Jesus entered Jerusalem through the Eastern Gate, he will come back through the Eastern Gate. And just as the people welcomed him with palm branches and shouts of Hosanna, we should welcome him with joy and gratitude. And just as the people followed him and listened to his teachings, we should follow him and obey his commands. The Eastern Gate calls us to repent, trust, and obey Jesus, and to share his love and truth with others. So my friends, I hope this video has helped you to understand more about the Eastern Gate of Jerusalem and what it means for us as Christians. I hope it has encouraged you to appreciate God's mercy, grace, and salvation, and to prepare yourself for his return. Lord Jesus, Thank you for entering Jerusalem through the Eastern Gate and for dying on the cross for my sins. Thank you for rising from the dead and for ascending to heaven. Thank you for sending your Holy Spirit and for preparing a place for me. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, and the Savior of the world. I repent of my sins and I trust in you. 
I obey your commands, and I follow your example. I welcome you into my heart, and I look forward to your return. Please help me to share your gospel with others, and to live for your glory. Amen. Glory. Amen. Glory. Amen.